Have you got a recipe for the day when everything falls apart? So asked the great Old Testament scholar Alec Matir at the beginning of his reflections on Psalm 89 in his little devotional book, Psalms by the Day. And it's the right question to be asking as we come to Psalm 89. What are you going to do and say when things are apparently going horribly wrong? What are those words and actions going to be motivated by? It feels like a bit of a jarring question to ask on a nice Sunday evening in the summer, but it matters. Bad things happen to people all the time. Just look at the events of this week. Drought, floods, strikes, the murder of a man in a mobility scooter. But it's not just out there, is it? It's in here as well. Things that don't make the front page of the BBC News or send Twitter into meltdown, but they are earth-shattering on a personal level. The bad news after a scan, communicated in sort of hushed tones, with lots of caveats, but still devastating. That's, as many of you know, the repeated scenario that my wife and I have faced over the last year or so uh, with our second son, Timothy, in hospital with a uh, heart condition. But it, it's not just us. We all know that feeling. It could be the changes at work that mean that the next six months are going to be really hard or end in unemployment. The email from your energy provider saying that your tariff is going up again. Those A-level results on Thursday that weren't what you were expecting or hoping. What is your recipe for moments like that? And what part does God play in that recipe? Psalm 89 was written in and for times like that, times when national disaster meant personal hardship. The psalm doesn't tell us much about the specific sort of historical background of what was going on, but the most likely is the exile to Babylon, the result of hundreds of years of Israel turning her back on God, rejecting the warnings of the prophets, and going after foreign idols and security from foreign nations in exchange for forsaking trust in the Lord their God. We'll get into the detail of the psalm in a minute, but it's important to think just how big a deal this would have been, how big a shock the exile would have been to the Israelites. Other parts of the Old Testament, like Jeremiah and Lamentations, they paint that picture. People could just not believe that such a thing could ever happen. Because surely, despite all the warnings, God would not let Jerusalem, his holy city, or the temple, his footstool on earth, fall into the hands of his enemies. It's like the myth about the kingdom standing forever, as long as there are ravens in the Tower of London. But it's just that. It's a myth. In 587 BC, the Babylonians marched into the capital and looted the temple and deported many of the people, leaving only the poor of the land. A time of real trauma that would have made every day really tough. Violence, extortion, just par for the course. In fact, this is the lowest point of all the book of Psalms, all the Psalms, even worse than the closing line of Psalm 88, if you look at that just before our psalm. Darkness is my closest friend. But actually, Psalm 89 comes after that because it is the lowest point. The whole psalm is shaped to help us see that shock as the psalmist sings about it. You may have noticed the sudden sort of change of tone. Luke brought it out so helpfully in, psalm, in verse 38. As the mood music goes from kind of confident and praising to lament, 
So we're going to look at the ingredients in the recipe for that day of disaster when the world seems to be falling apart around us. So here's the first one. Ingredient one, a powerful God of incomparable faithfulness. This is from verses 1 to 18, a powerful God of incomparable faithfulness. So have a look at verse 1. The psalmist tells us what his sort of theme for the beginning is going to be. Verse 1, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. Did you notice sort of three repeated points in both verses? The Lord God who the psalmist is singing about is a God of great love. That's in the first part of each of the two verses. Then he's a God of great faithfulness. That's his consistency to himself and therefore in all the ways that he deals with the world. That's the second half of each verse. And then thirdly, in sort of each half verse, there's a permanence to that arrangement. Have a look at it. It's forever, through all generations, forever again in verse 2, and then in heaven itself. And these three, three things taken together, together, the permanence of God's love and faithfulness, they add up to a pretty powerful picture. God's intentions, at least, are always and forever good. He loves what he has made, and he is always faithful to the good purposes he has for everything that he has created. And the specific outworking that the psalmist wants to talk about is there in verse 4. It's the promises, the covenant with King David. That's the solemn promise that God made to King David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, and it's sort of summed up in verse 4. I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. Every Israelite would have known and clung to that promise because it should have guaranteed their safety and their prosperity forever. As long as there was a descendant of David sitting on the throne, things should have been fine for God's people. So by the end of verse 4, things were looking pretty rosy. It was good. God has bound himself to Israel like a husband to a wife, promising if you stick with me, things will be good. Everything will be fine. But obviously, like all promises, its value is only as great as the ability of the maker to actually keep it. That's why banks do checks, to make sure that borrowers have some chance of actually paying them back. And that's what verses 5 to 18 are all about. The question is, does God have the ability to keep his promises? And the clear answer is, you bet he does. In fact, verse 6, no one compares with him. Even in the heavens, 4 verse 11, he created them. He smashes enemies, verse 10. Rahab is uh, another name for a mythical sea monster. And verse 13, he is super powerful. Your arm is endowed with power. Your hand is strong. Your right hand exalted. He can keep his promises. And in case we sort of get confused and think it's all about raw power, have a look at verses 14 and 15. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, Lord. Is it not good to walk with a God like that, who is righteousness, justice, love, and faithfulness? He is a powerful God of incomparable faithfulness. He can keep his promises. That's our first ingredient. But the psalmist moves on, and here's the second ingredient. He is a God of sure promises. A God of sure promises, verses 19 to 37. 
I'm afraid we're only going to touch on this quite briefly. The psalmist comes back to his theme of verses 3 and 4 about David in uh, these verses, and he makes the same broad point. He rehearses God's covenant to David, and he emphasizes just how much it is founded on God's own power and faithfulness. So as we um, scoot through the verses, see how much he talks God talks about himself. So, verse 19, he says, I have bestowed, I have raised up. Verse 20, I have found David. Verse 21, my hand, my arm. Verse 23, I will crush, I will strike down. Verse 24, my faithful love, my name. And on and on it goes through those verses. If this were not God speaking, perhaps we would say that he protests too much. If it was like one of those videos uh, that you see in a hardware shop where uh, the salesperson says uh, that the thing that you can buy for only $19.99 will revolutionize your cooking, keep you thin, and clean your kitchen at the same time. If they say it enough times in enough different ways with enough enthusiasm, well, surely it is actually true. But this is God we're listening to. And so he cannot oversell himself or overpromise. It's just not possible. When he says in verse 20 that David is the anointed one, the Messiah that we heard about in Psalm 2, or that he will be the most exalted of the kings of the earth, verse 27, that his line will last forever, then these things must be true. God does not lack the power or the faithfulness to carry these things through. He will not, verse 36, lie to David. As long as the sun and the moon are in the sky, so David's throne will endure. This is the God of sure promises. We've gone through that quickly, but that's evidence of God's promises being sure and unbreakable. And that makes the shock of the next section even greater as we come to verses uh, 38 to 45 and our third ingredient. And we see there's indignation at failing promises. Indignation at failing promises. Look again with me at verse 38. But you have rejected You have spurned. You have been very angry with your anointed one. You have renounced the covenant with your servant and have defiled his crown in the dust. This is God acting against his anointed one, not for him. Every detail of these verses, from verse 38 to 45, seem to overturn a promise of the first half of the psalm. So, verse 42, the right hand of the anointed's enemies is lifted high. But verse 13, it should have been God's right hand being lifted high, which, verse 25, in turn, would have exalted the king's right hand. It's topsy-turvy, it's the wrong way around. Or verse 44, The anointed one's throne is cast to the ground. Despite the promise of verse 4 and verse 29, that his throne will last forever. The defeat of God's king, the exile, should not happen. It seems to involve the overturning of God's promises. Either he is not powerful enough or he is not faithful enough. But then he is not God. All that he has revealed about himself collapses and the first half of the psalm makes no sense. So we ask again, what is our recipe for moments like this? when it looks like God's promises have failed. 
The psalmist recipe is in verses 46 to 51. It is one of indignation, anguished questions and calls for God to remember. He's stated the evidence as he sees it up to verse 45. Evidence which is, in his view, self-contradictory, that just doesn't make sense to him. Now, I love a good uh, detective novel, um, and here we've got the moment where Poirot, or whoever it is, just says, it does not make sense. I've laid out all the evidence, and it does not make sense. It must not be like this. The psalmist says it in verse 46. How long, Lord, until you act, until you show us what's really going on? Or verse 49. Lord, where is your former great love, which in your faithfulness you swore to David? He calls on God to remember that Israel needs answers in verses 47 and 48 before it's too late for them. Who are they? What are they without the Lord their God? but the butt of taunts and jokes and mockery, verses 50 and 51. That is what the psalmist says. He is indignant at God's failing promises. If you've been with us for the rest of uh, this summer series in the Psalms, you will know that the answer is going to be Jesus. And what a wonderful answer he is. But I don't want us to move on too quickly from the pain of Psalm 89. Let's stay there for a moment longer. Because this is biblical lament. This is trusting God and saying, when will this end? How can this be? Please make it better, Lord. Are we willing to use this God-given recipe for the day when everything seems to be falling apart around us and God no longer looks as if he is faithful and powerful. The psalmist does not abandon trust in the Lord his God. The praise of verse 52, though it looks short and perhaps confused, is real. The repetition of all God's powerful attributes at the beginning of the psalm, they are real too. The psalmist is reminding God and himself of God's incredible power, his character, his actions. Alec Matir again says that this means we need to sing more songs that sound like the first half of the psalm remembering how good God is, so that when things are tough, that is what is ringing in our ears and echoing round our hearts. And our prayers should be like verses 46 to 51. Bewilderment and indignation, calling God back to the wonderful promises that he's made. That's why it's so important to be in God's word so that we call him to the things that he's actually said to us, the promises that he's made. What promise are you going to hang on to at a tough moment this week? It was good to sit in that lament, but it is also good to move on to our final ingredient, the binding agent that keeps it all together. So ingredient four, the God of kept promises. The God of kept promises. Psalm 89 is placed at the end of one of the books of the Psalms. The Psalms are divided into five books, collections of Psalms. And you can see the book four starts after verse 52 of our Psalm. It's there before Psalm 90. That's the beginning. And whoever put the Psalms together like that did it on purpose. Books one and two have a lot about King David and God's anointed king and how great it is to have him. 
But there's a note of caution that kind of comes in in book three, ending with the desperation of Psalm 89 and how awful it is. As we've said, the question is, how can God be faithful if his promised king is not on the throne and the people are in exile? One answer to that is found in book four of the Psalms. So flick over one page and look at the first verse, or first two verses of Psalm 93. This pretty much sums up the message of book four. 93 verse 1. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is established firm and secure. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. God is king, celebrates the psalmist. But the question remains, what about the promises to David? What about the human who Psalms 2 and 8 tell us is going to rule forever? For God to be faithful to those promises, there needs to be an answer to that too. And of course there is. We, sitting in our souls this evening, are in a different situation from the first hearers of this psalm, this song. We live our lives and we hold our faith after Jesus has come the first time. So think back to uh, the detective novel. The psalmist is the detective saying, this just does not make sense. The evidence does not add up. And the first readers agree. But with Jesus, we have the unraveling, the explanation of how it all makes sense, where it all falls into place for Poirot and his little gray selves. Jesus is the answer to the questions of verses 46 to 51. Jesus is God's solution when called on to remember his promises of old. Which is why the New Testament is so keen to point out that Jesus is the son of David. Think of Paul at the beginning of his letter to the Romans. Uh, this is 1 verses 2 and 3. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, here's the important bit, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David. Or again, when he's preaching in Pisidian Antioch, recorded in Acts 13, Paul actually uses verse 20 of our psalm when speaking about God choosing David. He then says, from this man, from David's descendants, God has brought to Israel the saviour Jesus, just as he promised. Or come with me briefly to Matthew chapter 1. It's on page uh, 965. We'll, we'll end here in a moment. Matthew chapter 1, the very beginning of the New Testament. See how it starts. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. That's the anointed one. The son of David the son of Abraham. And then Matthew sets out for us how Jesus is descended from David and from Abraham. And interestingly also, how we get from the exile down to Jesus. Why is that so important? Well, because if Jesus isn't the son of David, he's not the anointed one, he's not the Messiah the one who will sit on David's throne forever. If Jesus is not the son of David, he is not the true king. And God would just be another over-promising, under-delivering liar who wouldn't deserve our trust and our obedience. We would not be able to call out to him on the day when everything seems to be falling apart around us. When, as verse 50 of our psalm put it, we are mocked and bear the taunts of God's enemies. There is no point calling out 
to him when everything falls apart, if that were true. But it does make perfect sense to trust him and to call out to him, the one who moved heaven and earth to keep his promises to David, to humanity, to provide the perfect ruler for us forever. God's king, who was rejected by humans and forsaken by God, as we saw in Psalm 22, he is Jesus. Come back next week to hear Psalm 110 declare that he is that perfect ruler forever. When the world seems to be falling, around, falling apart around us, as it felt like it was on Thursday morning in hospital for me, let's call out to our powerful and faithful God, the God of sure promises, the one who has placed Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, on the throne forever. And let's use the psalmist recipe with Jesus as its binding agent, bringing it all together. Oh, how we must long for that day when we see him returning as conquering king and all of God's promises are fulfilled perfectly for us. Now lead us in a prayer. Our Father, thank you that you are the God of kept promises, faithful and powerful. And we pray that uh, this week, in the weeks and months to come, we would trust in those promises. Trust in Jesus, our King. And we ask it in his precious and powerful name. Amen.